Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer 5. Today we're gonna to be talking about five games that are unique that you should play. Now some of these games are a little niche and some of them are very extremely like popular, but that doesn't mean you've played any of them. So if you've not tried maybe one of these games, maybe you should give them a go. They all contain unique mechanics, something different and interesting that I haven't seen before up until they were made, in which case maybe some of them have gotten a retreatment from other games or expansions, but let alone, we'll go ahead and show you these five really cool games individually and you can go ahead and decide whether it's something you should try out because in my opinion if you haven't played these games you haven't lived. So here we have We're Doomed by Breaking Games. It's a 4 to 10 player game that takes exactly 15 minutes to play and in this game you're going to be taking one of these type of uh, ocracies, like a technocracy, a democracy, etc, etc. You'll get one of these and every player is going to have the same type of abilities. Produce, indoctrinate, uh, propagandize, invade, and nuke. And you'll be utilizing these actions on your turn. You'll pick one of them and you'll pass. Now, basically what is happening in We're Doomed is the world is going to end and there's going to be a rocket ship that everybody's building, but not enough seats are going to be on it. And so you, um, among the up to 10 people that you're playing with, are attempting to either gain enough influence to make sure that you're guaranteed a seat or enough resources go into the supply, which is actually utilizing this box here, the project area in the box, uh, and based on the number of resources, how many people can show up. So if you all work together really well, technically it's possible that all of you can escape. But if you're not able to get enough resources in the bag, depending on the number of players, whoever has the most of these influence tokens is gonna to be first to get on the rocket, and second, and third, and everybody else is left out to dry. You'll be taking actions in the game, like gathering resources, gathering an influence, a sp a spending resources to steal influence, invading, a spending an influence to steal two resources, or nuking, eliminating a player straight out of the game with resources. Uh, the only unique, tricky thing to the game, other than just how, how it plays normally is you have this event deck and after every round everybody's gone around once you'll draw a card from here and that person is going to basically go be doing whatever it says some are hidden some are revealed what the person who draws this is going to be based on whoever puts that in the most resources in the bin at the end of the round and the card could say something like oh you have to eliminate one player it starts forcing people to decide to do certain things in the game uh, so this one here is population control after the escape rocket is launched the first player who board chooses one other player on the rocket to eject into space, eliminating them and their seat. This vacancy cannot be killed. So you are going to be getting these cards and you'll be forced to make decisions you probably normally wouldn't want to make. It also is a way to waste the time of the game, making you recite the letter of the alphabet backwards. Things that kind of push the sand timer because you only have, as, as far as time goes, this timer to get all the resources that you need. And it always ends in, in, in misery. <laughs> this game never happens the way, like no, nothing ever ends the way people want them to want it to end. Uh, it's very, very rare where everybody gets to escape on the rocket. It's even um, more unlikely for you specifically to succeed because most of the time at least half the players get nuked, but it's always a fun time. It doesn't really matter at the end of the game who makes it on the rocket and who doesn't. There's always uh, a wonderful little experiences that happen throughout the game. Uh, this is one of those games that can kind of tear people ap apart if they're not able to kind of have fun and be okay with people just simply nuking them out of the game. It has elimination, but because the game is so damn quick and you're not likely to be eliminated in the first 10 minutes of play, it doesn't necessarily matter all that much. There's rivalries and most of those rivalries will progress from this game up until the next game or uh, the next one of these games. So uh, there's that into, you know, think about. But yeah, this game is just really cool. It's a real time game that utilizes a finite resource pool that allows you to try and either do one of two things to win, care about yourself or care about the group. But in either case, you're not guaranteed anything. And it's this unique little social experiment of how you want to decide who gets to go on the rocket and who is going to be playing what cards on, on who and what type of thing you're going to be doing. And like I could produce, or maybe I should indoctrinate. Maybe we're not have enough resources, I, I might not get it on, on and I have, in, I have no influence, so I need to push that. Or uh, it just has all these like different little options in the game. It's really quick to teach and it's really fun. It's pretty simple and straightforward, but at the end of the day, this game is gonna be one of those that either uh, explodes the group in a negative way or a positive way. Regardless, you should try We're Doomed. Let's talk about a more mainstream, more popular AAA style game made by AEG, designed by John DeClaire. This is a game that plays up to six players with the expansion content, or it plays two to four players, and this is a deck builder. Most people know what deck builders are. You draw cards, 
and then you will utilize those cards to buy cards. Those cards will go to your discard pile along with what you bought. Eventually your deck will run out. You'll reshuffle your discard pile along with all the cards in there that you bought, and now you have new cards added to your deck, thusly progressively increasing the deck that you originally started out with, with new and better cards, creating engines, creating ways for you to produce resources or characters or uh, fighting machines. It, 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 it could be anything. There's a ton of different deck builders out there. Mystic Veil is a unique experience. Now, I, I know probably most of you have probably played this game, but if you haven't played this game, um, I'm going to explain the reasons why you should. I own everything from Mystic Veil. I love Mystic Veil. It is a wonderful little solitaire game that plays with multiple people. There's little interaction in this game when it comes to what I do and what you do, other than how you choose to purchase and what people choose to purchase before it gets to your turn. Now, there's a wide variety of cards and tokens that you can get, but the variety of this game that makes it so interesting, the uniqueness about this game makes it so interesting, is the fact that your cards are actually going to be see-through, and they're gonna involve see-through sleeves and you're going to be implementing cards inside of your cards. You're gonna start with this deck here. This could be a red deck or a blue deck or a green deck. And on the back, you'll note that there are different sections on your cards. And uh, some of them are gonna be cursed lands, others are gonna be fertile soils, and uh, a few of them are gonna be blank as well. And throughout the game, just like any normal deck builder, uh, you're going to be purchasing these guys here, these sleeves that you're gonna be sliding in, or I guess I should say these, these cards that you'll slide in to your sleeves, thusly creating new cards in the game. And when you play these new cards, you'll get the benefits of whatever they used to be and whatever there are now on the cards that you've played after purchasing it, putting in your graveyard and then drawing back up. Another cool thing about this game is it's also a push your luck game. Push your luck generally means like, if I do this, it could result in a benefit, but it also could result in me suffering. If I go too far and keep pushing my luck, it could end up that I get nothing. In this game, you're trying to avoid getting a certain number of these little trees here, they're little red trees. And the way it works is you'll have your deck down and you're gonna be flipping over the top portion of the deck and putting it on top. And then you'll slide it off to the side and you'll keep doing that up until the point where you either bust, kind of like 21, or you stop, in which case you get everything that is on your field. And then you'll be purchasing from the store. I love the idea of card crafting. I love the idea of pushing your luck. And I also like the idea that I only have to interact. Some, sometimes I don't wanna like go crazy, interact aggressive, like maybe we're doomed, right? In this case here, it's just about the purchasing aspects. How well can you make your deck? Uh, what two type of combos can you utilize? There's a wide variety of cards and expansions and just the ability to kind of customize my play experience every single time I play is, is awesome. Everybody always starts off with the same deck, but no one ever ends with the same deck and they are always completely different with unique strategies. Some involve losing points to gain points, others involve purchasing boons that you're going to be utilizing throughout the game. Some are going to be involving just buying very expensive cards or cards that have a great power but a tremendous drawback as well. So if you've never played a card crafting game that literally uses these little sleeves here that let you slide in new cards to them, this is the granddaddy of those games. This is the original, the OG, and this is the one that you should definitely try. Now, of course, there are a ton of new games out there, such as Dead Reckoning. This game here, Dead Reckoning, this is a small expansion box. Um, as well as this game over here, Edge of Darkness, and as you can see, I like these type of games, uh, that present a unique new experience, could basically involving um, uh, where, you're, where you're kind of either working together or working against each other, fighting uh, each other, utilizing unique systems. But this is just the basic deck building, uh, deck builder type uh, pusher luck strategy game. And I really, really love this game. I'll play this game whenever I get a chance, whenever anybody wants to play it. So I've played this game many, many times. And I've gotten pretty good at it too. Okay, another interesting game. This is a game that if you haven't played, you definitely should. It's a party game. It is a deduction game. It is a one player is working with a bunch of players, hoping that one of them will win so that that player can win as well. Basically how it works is it's a two to six player game. It uh, takes about 45 minutes and it's by Lucky Duck. And you are playing as investigators, paranormal detectives, and one player is a ghost. And that player is attempting to try and tell the people in the table, on the table, how they died. Now that player can't speak, um, and the investigators are gonna utilize their cards to kind of give information out of that player. Uh, there are many different ways the ghost can speak to you. So basically on your turn as an investigator, you'll pass a card out to the ghost. And that card could say something like, 
the ghost mouths one word. So I might ask, hey, how did you die? And then the ghost can go, you know, and, and if you can read lips, I might help you, right? And if not, that makes no sense to you at all. Or perhaps the card is gonna be something like, the ghost places markers on the talking board. And we look at this talking board or this, this area over here, and, or we look over here, it just depends on what the card says, right? Um, and you'll be able to move certain pieces, there's a bunch of tokens in here, uh, to determine, uh, to give the answer the best you can as the ghost, giving that player benefit. Now each player is gonna have a hidden board that they're going to utilize to kind of determine the who, what, where, and how, and what weapon. And each player is gonna have notes, and these are all dry erase, so you can rinse and repeat and play this game over and over again. There's a wide variety of different types of scenarios that could have taken place. Maybe a woman fell off a cliff while she was texting or got hit by a car while riding her bike. Maybe you're utilizing strands to draw, or to like make up what a car looks like and a woman on her bike, which can be very challenging as a ghost, but it's very, very, it's a very, very interactive experience. In fact, you'll have to kind of get a little close to each other as well. So if you're playing with new, new people you've never met before, it's actually a really cool aspect. It makes people like, I don't know, necessarily uncomfortable, but I think it increases the comfort level in the room. Like for instance, one of the things you can do as a ghost is they'll play a card that will let you draw on their back, maybe what weapon it was or how they died. And you have to kind of draw something that will give them a hint that only they can feel all while touching their back. Um, or maybe that you have to whisper something. There's just a bunch of different ways to give people clues. And, and basically, at the end of everybody's turn, or each player's turn, they have an opportunity to say, I know the answer, just like in the game Clue, a very classic game. And they go, you were a woman who was riding her bike, and then the car hit you, and blah, 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 blah. And, and then you as a ghost will say, like, here's how many you got right, or you got them all right, in which case that player wins. And you can rinse and repeat. You can play with different ghosts, uh, different players. This has been a game that I, have, <laughs> that I have stuck around with for a long time. It's very simple. It's very easy to understand. It's very easy to teach. And it just has a, it has a really strong staying <laughs> power in my game group because this is something that we get to play with each other on multiple different levels. It, it, it's, it's in a way of like a little bit of deduction, it's social, there's like physicality to it, there's kind of an emotional attachment to this game. It, it's a really, really great little game. If you've never played Paranormal Detec Detectives and you want a detective game that's kind of based around a party environment, then this is the one that I would strongly suggest. I, I am very impressed with it. It's, it's very unique in this, in this aspect of one players trying to help at least one of all the other players to win. Because at the end of the game, if all the rounds pass and play, people, people are out of cards, whatever, and no one has it, then everybody loses, including the ghost. Okay, we're coming down to the wire. Just two more games. The next one is Jack's Friends. This is a tiny game. This is basically Grim Forest, if you guys know what that game is, in a tiny little box. Uh, and this plays two to six players, and it's only a 15 minute game. And I have kept this game, and I've enjoyed this game for a very long period of time. In this game, one of you is playing as, um, well, one of you is playing as the giant, and everybody else is playing as Jack's friends. And Jack's friends are all trying to gather resources from the giant, while the giant is trying to smush Jack's friends to not allow them to gather resources based on the number of players, that will determine what type of resources you need. And in some cases, you're gonna be getting, uh, you'll need, oh, I don't know, three apples and uh, two meat. Um, or, you, or you're gonna need like, uh, let's say here, not nine apples and six eggs, or you'll need 11 villages. And the way that works is one player plays the giant and it's, they're gonna get this deck of cards which has a bunch of hands smushing a bunch of areas. And everybody else is gonna get a house where they store resources and their cards, which are also the different locations. And so, it looks something like this. Uh, these are gonna go on different locations in the game. You'll see there, there's meat, there's houses, there's apples, there's eggs. And the way it works is each player secretly chooses a card. The giants will place one down and each of the players will place a card down. And then you reveal. After you reveal, each player they got to a location that has a resource will take that location. So the garden, great, he got a, uh, a fruit or a, yeah, a fruit, an apple. And this person played a kitchen and this person is gonna get a meat. And the giant chose hen house. No one chose hen house, so the giant smushes nobody. However, 
if the giant had uh, had actually got somebody, so instead let's say that I chose the garden, I would actually smush this player. They would not get anything. They'd be out the next round and I would increase my smushing ratio. Now the giant can win in one of two ways. Either I smush enough people to the point where there are no more smushings needed or by the end of the last round, and you use this deck for every single round, uh, nobody gets the resources required based on the number of players in the game. And the other way that it happens for the opposite end is the other players that are playing the game is they need to reach a certain number of fruits, vegetables, meat, and or these houses here in order to win the game. And you're just simply playing cards. You'll play that card, put it back in your hand. You can then go ahead and mix them up. You can play the same card down again if you want or switch up and play a different card. There's some unique little variations to the rules, but overall, it's just a really fun game. This is basically one of those games that has that kind of cool element of like deduction. Where are they going to go? How many resources do they need? Is it likely that all of them will actually go to the hen house because that's all they need? Or is it more likely they'll go and get one of those apples? But I only need to smush them one time, so maybe I should just go to the apples. Oh no, all three actually did go. They can't speak about what they're doing. So players that are working together are like, are we gonna go to the place? Are we gonna, you know, and you have to kind of non-verbally communicate this stuff and it provides some really wacky results. It's kind of like the mind in that way where just things kind of happen the way they should happen, but not always. And you can kind of predict what people are gonna to want to do as you get used to how they play. It's a little tiny game. It's got some tokens, it's got some cards and uh, that's pretty much it. And the game plays excellent. This is a game that I strongly recommend to people. I know it's a really small indie game. I'd like to see this be even be reproduced on a little bigger box with even cooler components with little player boards and additional little ways to, to do stuff. But I mean, really, as it stands, as it plays, I don't really think it needs a whole lot more. It does exactly what I want it to do. It's quick, it's simple, and it has a unique experience of a, a one versus many that just involves a little light deduction in a tiny box, which is excellent. I love the fact that it's one of these few games that has kind of a light deduction aspect to it. Like, push your luck type of aspect to it, resource gathering, but it's all just play a card. I can teach anybody this game. Grandma knows how to play this game by heart. Down to numero uno. Now, not necessarily my best pick or in any order. Uh, these are just five games I thought that you guys should be aware of because they provide these unique experiences, but this game is called Captain Sonar by Madigo. Uh, I imagine most of you have also probably heard of Captain Sonar, but maybe you have or have not played it. Um, and if you haven't, then good. This video is mainly for you. This is a two to eight player game that takes about 45 minutes and is ages 14 and up. And this game, <laughs> it says two to eight players. It's lying to you. This game is six or eight players. You have some flexibility and you can change things based on the experience of the players, but to get the experience that you deserve, that you should have, you should play with the max number of players. Uh, this is another very unique game that I have not seen a whole lot of uh, my games kind of reproduce this. Uh, it is, and probably for good reason too, because it doesn't hit the table all that often just because of how the game plays. But if you don't have it, this is probably the one to get. Uh, this one here is going to provide you with huge stands or like hide, it'll hide your entire table so that one side of the table has got all their stuff hidden down below here and the other side has got their stuff hidden from the other team and it plays a four on four and each player is gonna be getting a specific role. There's gonna be these blank sheets here, there's gonna be different locations that you can choose to play on, and there's going to be uh, a bunch of different options <laughs> as far as the different locations. I might have even a few promos for this game because I, I really, really like it. But yeah, you're gonna be playing as maybe the engineer or the captain or the sonar calculator. And how this game works, really, just to simplify it so I don't have to get into all the components, is this game is Battleship. You ever played the classic game Battleship? That's what this game is, it's Battleship. But it's played in real time. Somewhere on this map here is going to be where you start, and somewhere is gonna be where your opponents start. You don't know where they start and they don't know where you start. All they know is where you are going. And so you'll be like going south and then you know, going uh, east and going south and going west and you'll be moving along this map and you'll have somebody on the opposite team trying to dedu deduct or deduce where you are and they'll be utilizing certain boards to do so. The captain is going to be in control of where the ship is going and when to use certain aspects to, of the ship like firing, 
to work with the navigator to determine where the enemy is. Um, you can have a character who's kind of functioning with the engines to make sure that you are only allowed to move in certain directions, otherwise something can happen to your ship. And you're trying to damage your opponent's ship. You're just basically trying to hit your opponent's uh, ship three times. You have ways of doing so, like missiles. Um, you have bombs you can drop in the water, and, and, and so on and so forth. You'll be able to like detonate certain things in the game, the map, there's an island you'll have to avoid. It has a lot going for it. There is also a turn-based system where I can, our, we take a turn, you guys take a turn, we kind of go back and forth. And that's a fine way to like learn the game and start off with the game. But where this game's real, real, really cool aspect lies is being able to play in real time. Everybody's yelling, everybody's shouting, everybody has their own unique job, everybody coordinates with the captain, and he, can, he or she coordinates back with them, and the opposite team does the same. Players will be yelling, stop! I'm firing at this place. Miss? Okay, keep going. Or stop, detonate a mine at E5. Hit? Nice, one point of damage. And you're just trying to eliminate your other opposing ship, your other opposing submarine. With a ton of variability as to how you play, each time you can switch up your crew if you want, or go head to head and just go back and forth. This game has got a ton of fun in it. Now, it is, of course, very specific and limited to the number of players. Realistically, you could play uh, three on three and have one player use two positions, but I really wouldn't go farther than that. I mean, if you have four really great players, it might not be so bad. You could have two, play two players both play with four mats. The, there's like an engineer, a navigator, the, the captain, and, the, uh, and the, the guy who does all the, the mechanic. And this, anyway, there's those four classes, and you can kind of divvy it up as you as you see fit. But this game shines at a, as, a, as an eight-player game. It shines at a party situation. Everybody jumps in and plays this game. Whenever I've got enough players to do this, I draw, I bring it out, especially if they haven't played it before. Tell them the rules, explain how each of their classes work, and they just get into it. And after about five ten minutes, they are ready to go. And this game becomes a wonderful real-life simulator of the game Battleship. And Captain Sonar is a game that's going to stay in my collection for literally ever. I'm never going to get rid of this game. Uh, I can't, I can't see why I would. They'd have to make a deluxified, super deluxified version with, like, I don't know, something. But I, on its own, yeah, this is, this is going to be staying until something really comes along that does exactly the same thing, but better. And so far, nothing has come close. This is a wonderful game as long as it meets your niche of that eight player counter, but I, I love it. Yes, this, this game, pick it up. Yeah, so there you go, five unique games that if you haven't tried, you definitely should. And perhaps if one of them caught your fancy, you can go ahead and check out the links below and pick one of them up. I love all these games for various different reasons. Mystic Veil is a wonderful deck builder slash card crafting mechanic that also has push your luck. Captain Sonar is this wonderful party experience. We've got two teams of four yelling at each other, going back and forth, playing a real life battleship. We're doomed as a bunch of people working together until they're not. Everybody thinks they're going to do the right thing. And then at the end of the game, no one does the right thing. And that kind of tells you about what happens when the, the objective of thinking you can all win and then realizing that you can't win and how that social dilemma kind of interacts with other players. Paranormal, um, Paranormal Detectives, that game is one of those great little social games, getting to know people, being able to interact with people in different ways in a game that you might not have thought you could do. Being able to work with all players as the ghost, but knowing that you only really, really need one of them to help you solve the case, which becomes a little bit of this clue dilemma. And then we have Jack's Friends. It's a tiny box game. It's simple, it's straightforward. You're flipping over cards, gathering resources, or you're the giant, you're flipping over cards, trying to smush people at those locations and attempting to kind of reach your goal before the countdown ends and the giant is able to either A, smush a bunch of people up or make sure that you don't gather the resources that you need to escape from the, you know, the beanstalk and go down with all your golden goose's eggs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they're all wonderful little games. They're all very unique in their own way. And for the most part, I really haven't seen any games that do this in a similar way, these games in a similar way. So now it's up to you. If you know of any games that are similar to these games or a better version of these games, I want you to let me know in the comments below because as far as I know, these games do what they do best. And that's why I thought you should take a look at them because they're so unique and interesting and fun. And I've kept them for so long because I love these games. Tell me games that you like that are unique as well. 
Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer uh, Board Game 5. If you're interested in any of the games, like I said, there's a link down below in the description. I have here my, my handy co-host, my Ash from Army of Darkness. This is one of the original dolls. Yeah, it's a doll. It's not actually an action figure, but it's so freaking cool. He's going to be my little mascot for the rest of this outtake here. But if you want, you can go ahead and check out our website, unfilteredgamer.com, blog post, giveaways, kicks, our list, and more. And if you don't want Ash to chainsaw you in half, I strongly suggest you hit the subscribe button, as well as perhaps the... Uh, bell notification button, as long as you don't want to get the boomstick. <laughs> He's so cool. I've clubbed, I have all these guys. I've got, I've got like three sets of him. Uh, you can also go ahead and check out our live streams every Wednesday on whatnot at 6.30 p.m. PST and on Sunday at 6.30 p.m. PST on Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook. We play games just like these ones here. In fact, we have played Paranormal Detectives. We've played Jack's Friends. We've played, I think, Mystic Veil 2, and we've played We're Doomed. I haven't played Captain Sonar. I think it'd be pretty challenging to film a live stream with eight players, but I wouldn't be opposed to it. Anyway, guys, as always, I look forward to seeing you guys next time. Hail to the king, baby. <laughs>